since I met. What's up, Doctor Who fans? Pete here from Comic Books Transformed. We talk about adaptations from comic books into streaming shows and movies. Doctor Who has been made into comic books multiple times, and uh, it's gone back to Marvel Comics. But then also, um, I think, I believe, Titan Comics makes a Doctor Who book. Did you know about that, my special guest and friend, Mike Bongiorno? I do, I do, but I don't read the uh, Doctor Who comics, or I haven't really read any. Yeah, it's interesting because um, some of the guys that write those Doctor Who comics uh, that have also watched like Doctor Who uh, or written Doctor Who shows uh, are also like big comic book writers. And there's one guy named Paul Cornell. He's this like uh-huh. British writer. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you know that guy. And then another guy, I believe, is Kevin Scott, and he's written some, like, Star Wars stuff, and he's a Doctor Who guy, too. Uh, so there's always, like, crossover between the movies. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Do you like any kind of tie-in, like, comics, like, adaptations of things? Uh, well, you and I have talked about the Power Rangers comics. Shit, yeah. Uh, I did like those. I, I haven't – I've just had a, a year or so where I haven't really read a lot of comics. I kind of go on and off with comics. And um, I've never been somebody who could read, um, like, issues month to month. Yes. I don't think I have the memory for it, really. I think I have to do trades. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. It's like a complete story by itself. Um, it's like reading a novel or something like that. Yeah. I uh, just saw Mike, for you guys that are watching or listening, I just saw Mike in person last week. Uh, I'd returned to Staten Island after a while for a funeral. And uh, I got to meet with Mike and Brian, who's from the show, and then Danny, of course, from the Lasser cast, and Chris, who's been on there as well. Um, and, you know, Mike, I'm just bringing that up because I went to Jim Hanley's before I met with you. Do you mean JHU? Yes, JHU, for those yeah. that are in the know, that are like Evan Dorkin fans and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just one of the comic book creators that hangs out there. Um, have you been there in a while? uh probably like two months ago uh that's that's kind of recent yeah what was i getting shit this is an anticlimactic story i don't remember what i was getting oh no i was trying to get godzilla comics oh okay okay (laughs) and i promise everyone we're going to eventually talk about doctor who the anniversary specials two and three but uh i just saw Godzilla minus one recently, and that was... All right, let's just talk about it for an hour or so. Okay, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. That movie, I, I wish I was covered it on this channel. That was phenomenal. I agree. It was, <laughs> it was, it was incredible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, let's try to get on topic. That's not your fault at all. It's mine. Doctor Who, <laughs> the anniversary specials, David Tennant is back, and he's the 14th Doctor. We talked about it uh, last week or two weeks ago. We liked the first special very much, and now um, we come to an episode that feels very much like a standard Doctor Who episode, uh-huh. um, and that was Wild Blue Yonder. Yeah. Uh, do you, I mean, I, maybe you're like me, and do you kind of notice that there's sort of a, maybe like three structures to Doctor Who episodes, and I think that sure. these specials yeah. each have one of those structures, right? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, there's like... Um go on an adventure with a historical figure they're stuck on us they're stuck on a doomed spaceship there's you know um uh yeah there's like there's basically like maybe like five different yeah Yeah. Russell T Davies is very good on with the stuck on a spaceship one Okay, I am so glad you brought that up because this episode, I think probably an adjective people have used to describe it as minimalistic. I feel sure, like yeah. there's not a lot to it, even though it has this like incredible set. Yeah. Uh, but it's just essentially two actors after the credits, the opening credits of the show. Yeah. 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 Uh, what did you think of that opening scene though with Isaac Newton? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I really liked the Mavity joke. Uh, somebody put on a somebody. I fell for it. Somebody put a clip up of Peter Capaldi's doctor saying the word gravity, mm. and they titled the YouTube clip like "Peter Capaldi messes up a line, but they keep it in the show." Mm. The okay. gravity instead of Mavity, and now we're all just gonna pretend like the word is Mavity. I think <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, 
Are people upset about it? I can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah, there's always this controversy when we talk about these sci-fi franchises. In this case, Isaac Newton, I, I don't even know what ethnicity the guy was that they played him, but they're like, oh, right. he's not a traditional white he's British right. guy. Right, right, right. 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 It, it didn't bother well, me. No, I mean, I uh, I can't think of, I'm sure there have been other instances in Doctor Who where they did this. I can't think of, off the top of my head, any examples but i also don't care right 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 (laughs) it's you know uh i think that it's probably the most famous example is that show bridgerton on netflix where essentially they're like okay we're gonna have these black british actors or african-american actors uh portraying these characters and it's from a time period where they wouldn't be in these roles and it's like i i don't have a problem with that you know at all if they're they kind of make it a point of like, that's what we're doing. You know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to like rewrite history, but I have no problem right. with giving opportunities for those roles for people of right. color. Well, like, right. Like, like they did during Jody Whitaker's um, tenure, a Rosa Parks episode, which I think is a really, it's one of my favorites of the Jody Whitaker time. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to mess with anybody's race in that. Right. Because it's, you're that's doing something very serious about yeah. it. And these are all like real people, right? So, 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 but Isaac Newton, it's really just a joke. I mean, it's not an episode about Isaac Newton. It's just a way to throw in like an opening gag. Right, 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 right. Very good point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because like, I, I like, I like Dr. Who now because it is so inclusive and, and diverse. And when you look at the old Dr. Who, it's very much just like, white british men and and yeah. white british women and that's pretty much it yeah and i think that that russell t davies and the showrunners have like made it a point to cast as many different types of actors as you and can it's, it's it's getting more and more inclusive yes um, the new doctor shudigatwa is not only a black actor but the actor is uh openly gay and there is a belief that the character will be at least queer coded yes yes um in the way that he dresses the way that he talks so i think uh I, you know what i always think of maybe this is a stereotype i always imagine like an old british man with like a cup of tea yes and he sees like a black doctor who and he's like <laughs> <laughs> he spits tea on his tv and then his wife comes in and she's like what are you on about henry and he's like oh they're doing it again <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's my, that's me being stereotypical. That's me. Yeah. All old white, <laughs> all the old white guys with tea who are upset. Yes. I, I loved the visual <laughs> you painted there and you even did a little teacup too. That was perfect. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I was so excited to talk about this with you. And when you started talking about old British men, I remember that um, you said to me last time, who would I pick to play the doctor? And honestly, I've been thinking since our last video about who I would have to pick the doctor. I want to pick somebody really good. Yes. So we'll get to that at the end. And I definitely want to talk about the 15th doctor and how he shows up. But uh, let's talk about this episode, uh, Wild Blue Yonder. So uh, for Wild Blue Yonder, the doctor and Donna, they get stuck on this ship. And everything in this ship seems to almost be like frozen in time. But things are moving extremely slowly. One key thing is that the TARDIS leaves them. And there was an interesting yeah. point there. For a guy like you who's watched all of New Who, do they ever make reference to this of how the TARDIS is the thing that makes them always translate other languages? Yes. Okay. They, okay. Yeah, they've okay. definitely talked about it a bunch of times. There's even an episode during either Matt Smith's era or Peter Capaldi's era during the Cold War where there are – Russians talking to Americans and they're understanding each other. Uh-huh. The doctor explains it's because the TARDIS is translating. Okay. It's just because almost no other science fiction go- does that. Yeah. Like it's it, like Star Trek. It's like, yeah, we all just speak English. Don't worry. <laughs> right. Right. I think um, on Star Trek, they have like universal translators. Yeah. There's, there's this really great show. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this last time. Farscape. Did you watch Farscape? I never watched Farscape. Okay, in Farscape, uh, they have this really great sequence when the guy from Earth, he ends up on this alien ship, and at first he's like, he can't tell what the fuck anyone's saying, and then they give him like some kind of bug 
that translates for him. And all of a sudden, everyone's speaking English. So I, they usually like kind of, uh, what is it, like lampshade or like where they kind of say once, like this is how we all speak English. And but then we'll that... think about it again. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's usually not a plot point. But in this episode, it's a plot point because yeah. the doctor doesn't understand what's being said on the ship. Yes, yes. The the ship keeps like every it's very still, like you said, but then a word will a sort of nonsense word will be said, and then things will move. Right. And then there's a robot that looks like Marvin from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right, right. It will take one step and the doctor can't remember, can't figure out what the language is. Right. Um uh, forgive me for those that are watching. Um I'm eating my lunch very late. I didn't have a chance to get before. <laughs> I'm sure that'll make for amazing audio on the podcast, yeah. but it's a good visual. Um, He's speaking his tea. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to spit it out eventually. We'll get to that <laughs> last episode. Um, <laughs> but with uh, this sequence, you know, at first it's like, okay, well, we got to figure out what's going on on this ship. And then I thought that there would be other characters they would introduce, but essentially they just introduced the Doctor and Donna again. Yes. And they're yeah. play as they call them the not things on this yeah. episode. And, um, did you like that take, or would you have rather had original characters on the ship? Well, you know, it's interesting. In this, like, little trilogy of specials, the first one is a real kind of interesting, fun adventure where you got, you know, the Doctor and all of a bunch of friends that we had, and we got a new cute alien that ends up being bad, and then you've got these big bug guys. So we went with this sort of smaller Doctor story that is very reflective of many older Doctor Who stories, even some ones that David Tennant did. Right. It reminds me of the one with Tennant where he's like on like, he's like on a space train or a space bus and everybody starts repeating each other or something and they can't figure out why. I totally forget the name of the episode. Yeah. But it reminded me a little bit of like that or one of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who is um, Heaven Sent, which is just Peter Capaldi alone. Um, basically like in a time loop. Yeah. So I did like that, and uh, so evil doppelgangers is a big thing in sci-fi in general, and yes. in Doctor Who. I yes. did think that these evil doppelgangers were done in an interesting way because they had the memories of who they were trying to emulate. Mm -hmm. So I think that made it actually kind of scary, and also uh, the audience is not really in on who's who at what time. Right. So it's really interesting to watch it and kind of be like, I don't know who's talking to who, what's really going on. Right, right. The, the way they did that was really clever. They were like, oh, essentially these creatures have the memories. They have their minds. Right. And so it's not like you can have this kind of moment of like, oh, what's my favorite type of chocolate? And like, I don't know. There's nothing like that because right. they know everything, essentially. There's only right, people right, 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 which is always like the game they play when it's like, no, I'm the real one. This guy's not the real one. Right, right. Yeah, remember your birthday on, you know, uh, 220. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Oh. But uh, what I was going to say was that um, you brought up that sci-fi has a lot of doppelgangers. Yeah. And in recent science fiction – and, and uh, you know, things like that, there's always these, like, alternate universes. Everything is about multiverses right now. And sure, that, yeah. that affords people the ability to meet with other versions of the characters, you know, like with DC Comics, with Marvel Comics, and other properties, too. And Doctor Who's kind of uh, immune to that because there's only really one well, modern... I, well, during Russell T. Davies' first era, there were two spinoffs that he made. And a third one that he tried that didn't go. He did um, Sarah Wood. Jane Chronicles. Yeah. Which was a more child-oriented show. And he did Torchwood. And right. I believe he wants to do that again. Oh. Because I think what they did in the third episode with the whole like unit in the unit tower that looks like Avengers Tower. It looks I just think like that's it. be its own thing. Okay. Okay. I spoke too soon. Okay. So, yeah, I totally forgot about... Torchwood and Sarah Jane Chronicles. I was thinking that, like, in the old well, Doctor... Do the... I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's hard to do. Like, in Marvel, there's a universe of heroes, right? Mm -hmm. In Doctor Who, if you've got a spinoff, it's like there's this one guy who's, like, the best guy ever, and then, but we're not with that guy. Right. You always sort of feel like, okay, well, this isn't... This, I'm not that interested in this. Like, the only episodes I've ever seen of 
like Sarah Jane or the ones where the doctor has a cameo. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think I did watch a couple of episodes of Torchwood, but you're right. It's sort of like, it's always going to be, because yeah, it's not based on this one character. It's always just the supporting people. Right. It's kind of like what Sony did with Spider-Man where it's like, okay, we can have everybody but Spider-Man. Right. For these right, movies. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this episode though is the antithesis of that. It's you got two doctors. There's an evil one and a good one. Yeah. And um, the doctor, the, there's this great moment with David Tennant where he's like by himself after he's gotten separated from Donna and he just starts like screaming. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. And he starts kicking. Um, it was after they mentioned something called the flux, which you gave me a uh, video of. Yes. And so, so, sorry, my daughter's in here too. You come to get this? Okay. Yeah. I'll come get you. Go close that door. Mm-hmm. Hi. Close the door. Um, so, can you explain the flux to people like me who haven't it seen those was, episodes? It was a the last. Basically, the not I mean, it wasn't a full season, but it was the last like big Jody Whitaker story. They actually did something like the original show where they did like five or six episodes all as one story, and that was the flux. And that's where you learn um, that the, the well, you had learned before that the doctor was like the timeless child, and right. and the other Gallifreyans are based on her DNA. But you learn like there's this woman who like adopted the doctor kind of is like the doctor's mother mm-hmm. kind of behind the flux and the flux is like I, I she's trying to like destroy all of existence mm-hmm. so basically tons and tons of people die yeah and, and that guilt is what's on the doctor david Tennant's mind okay and that's sort of why he's so like um it's it, i mean it's again it's like it's like going back to where he was when he first came back when he was like upset about the time war like he feels all this guilt, right? It, is Gallifrey destroyed once again? At this point, at this point, I don't remember. I don't know. Okay, yeah, I thought that they had said that the master had like destroyed Gallifrey this time around, that too. But I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't remember to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, but um, I think it's the Donna not thing that that says to him. Oh, no, 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 no. It couldn't be the Donna not thing because she wouldn't have his memories. It's the other, the doctor not thing that mentions the flux and he says half the universe died. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. must have been crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he's carrying all that guilt. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a good episode in terms of in these three episodes, you do have a narrative arc or character arc with the doctor. You've got this question of why would he be come back to David's tenant David Tennant's form right and you've got this idea of um you know like why did he find Donna again what is he running from what is going on in his mind you know he's just gotten off of the adventure that he was just in right as Jody Whitaker so I think this is a sort of so the, the wobble yonder is its own little little like scary weird episode i mean what i like about it is it's so weird it's weird doctor who yeah it's yeah fun. yeah uh, but it does get into l- larger things like um oh you know no 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 it was donna who said it it was the not thing of donna because the not thing of donna could read part of donna's mind and i think she couldn't oh it's okay like that like or, or, or when donna and the doctor like melded again in the first of the three episodes she sort of saw where he had been that's right that's right i was totally forgetting about how she had like sort of like a time lord's brain or something yeah that's right that's right okay very good point yeah so i mean you you have both characters these not things essentially just like kind of mentally torturing the regular characters and just kind of bring up their flaws and they say some pretty mean things to Donna Noble too. They say that, that she's dumb and stuff like that. Right, yeah. um, but their intent, essentially, these are creatures that exist outside of the universe. They live in this sort of like black void. Yeah. And their intent is essentially to come into our universe and just, I guess, mess things up. Right. They like the, the chaos and the brutality of our world that kind of like sings to them. Yes, yes. You know, and that's... I, I like that concept. There's definitely a lot of stories where there's like sort of this out outer thing, this thing that's almost like a Lovecraftian kind of thing that's outside of reality. 
and then it wants to like just come and create chaos in our world. You right. Know? And it also is an indictment of human nature. Yes. That, you know, they because they say like we weren't like this, but we heard the the echo of your universe and all the hate and stuff. Right. So it's an idea. And that I get is reflected a little bit in the third episode, too. I, I know I, I really want to talk about that specific point actually in the third episode. Um in this one, there's these great, I think it's all like practical effects, but then also digital effects where they show that these creatures aren't exactly great at maintaining their yeah. form. And so you have th these great sequences where their arms are super long. Yeah, right? it's super weird. Super yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, uh, guys, if you don't know, Mike and I covered A Nightmare on Elm Street on his show, Pop Culture Man Children. And, um, you know, we talked about Freddie having super long arms. It kind of reminded me of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's uncanny. It's got mm -hmm. that uncanny thing, which is what the doppelganger thing is all about anyway, right? Mm -hmm. um, something being familiar, but not exactly. Right. And, um, yeah. Something a little off. And then at one point, you know, they're, they're chasing them. They get so large at one point that they literally get stuck in a corridor of the ship. And it's just so yeah. funny to see David Tennant and uh, Catherine Tate. That's Donna Noble, yeah. right? Just like really just going for it. They're not holding back. They're just being as ridiculous as they can. Yeah, as yeah, these yeah. doppelgangers. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at the end, I was a little bit confused by this. And maybe you can clarify. Essentially, the, there's no laws and stuff of physics where they are like because they're on the outside of space essentially and so the doctor tries to come up with a law for them to kind of trap them or stop them yeah and he says you can't cross this line of salt yes and, and and um essentially by him doing that that's what brings in the toy maker in the next episode right yeah yeah in a okay. sort of hand wavy don't think too much about it way that's what leads to it it is an interesting idea uh, an intriguing idea that he says, like, I shouldn't have evoked a superstition at the edge of the universe where the walls are thin and anything's possible. Oh, you got the whole quote down and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, at the end of the third episode when the toy maker is, like, defeated and he's in a little box, um, uh, what's her name? The Brigadier's daughter. Kate says, put this in the, put this in the deepest um, uh, dungeon and, and, and uh, cover it with salt. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so there's like ramifications there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, all that stuff is is really creepy it, with the idea of like, like them being nothing and then they come in to like kind of take over. Um, and then once again, you know, the doctor's actions, even though he's doing something kind of on a whim, he's laying down the salt or they accidentally mention gravity to Isaac Newton. He calls it mavity. Yeah, yeah. There's all these little things that they do that like have universal level Yes. Uh, repercussions yeah. do you think that that was a theme that they were going for in these three episodes that's interesting um i hadn't thought about that i mean possibly yes i'm not yeah. sure what the larger yeah themes are going to be because i do think you know now as we go into shudigawa's episode which is like what a week from now two weeks from now when they do the christmas and then, and then I think there's a break between his first like full series. I think there's going to be themes that are sort of began now, because you yeah. have like you had the the meep saying, um, "Wait till I tell my boss." And then in this in the third episode, you have the toy maker say something like, "The ones who watch." I'll t he's mentioned some he mentioned some big bad that will come later. I think so, he says the I, one who waits. I think that's what he says. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um. Russell D. Davis, I think, was always good at like weaving things in, like Bad Wolf. Right, right. It's kind of like a, a Buffy thing where there's like smaller villains, but then there's this bigger villain that you get little glimpses of throughout the season. Right, right, right. The, exactly. Yeah. The monster of the week and then the big bad. Yeah, at the end. So, um, I'm just trying to think what else to say about this episode. There's well, great moments. What? Go ahead. I, to me, the most exciting thing, and it seems like the most exciting for a lot of people online was seeing Wilfred Mott, seeing Bernard Cribbins play oh, yes. Wilfred again. It's his last performance of right. a lifetime of doing work. He also, I don't know if people realize, he's a two-time companion because he plays a companion in the non-canon Doctor Who movies where oh, really? Peter Fishing is the Doctor. 
Okay. See, I'm glad you brought that up because that's where I was going to say they could have like, um, you know, various versions of the doctor. I mean, obviously Peter Cushing's dead, so you can't do it. Right. But there's like that continuity of him being the doctor. Right, right. I, well, I think they've... That, that leads to another question that I was wondering this week or the last couple of weeks is, do these episodes work as a 60th anniversary celebration? You know, like in the third episode, you had um, an old companion come back yeah, and you had a few references to the past. But, you know, compared to like what the 50th was, where they got everything in, they got every reference they got in the fourth doctor again. Yeah. It made me wonder, like, is these are good episodes, but do they work well? Do they function well as an anniversary celebration? So that is a good question. Uh, I'm thinking about this one thing that James Gunn said recently, where he said that having just certain ca character cameos, like superhero cameos in superhero movies, can be like cameo porn, where sure. it doesn't really serve the story, and it's just sure. there just to be a and cameo. Who is, uh, you know, can do that. Yeah, right. Jodie Whitaker, Whitaker's last episode has a bunch of other doctors right. like the jody whitaker i think either dies or something like dying and she's in her own mind and she's talking to her own consciousness and it's a bunch of the other actors that are basically every actor alive who has played the doctor and they're like morphing into each other as the oh. doctor talking to himself so she ended with like a big here's every doctor kind of episode oh okay i did not know that i actually would really like to see that um yeah, it's very interesting yeah, I so, so for me, just to answer your question, I feel like if they did something like where they had Matt Smith and David Tennant together for an episode, yeah, it's interesting that Matt Smith has not come back given how popular he was. I know, I know, I know. I, I everything it, I'm almost starting to feel like David Tennant's my favorite doctor just because of all the stuff I've been watching recently. But Matt Smith is actually my yeah. favorite doctor. Well, I know he's not your David Tennant now. What's that? We'll never be rid of David Tennant now. Right, right, right. And, forever. Right, and that's another thing we can kind of talk about uh, in the next episode. I feel like we keep just saying, we'll talk about this next, we'll talk about this next. But, um, I mean, the Wild Blue Yonder is, I think, very interesting. Um, and we can talk about it as much as you want to, but I think there's a lot of juicy stuff in the third episode, especially it's controversial changing to canon. And some people seem to love it, some people seem to hate it. And I'm interested in what you you think about some of those things. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, like, okay. So, do you want to say that for our next one, or do you want to do this in this one? Whatever you want to do. <laughs> uh, let's let's kind of keep it nice and tight, and I'll post this episode, and then we can talk about all the the big canon stuff in our next episode. Sure. But but for this one, um, I just was thinking there was one other thing I wanted to mention is that, um. There's the, the sequence at the end where they go to get off the ship. The ship is yeah. literally going to explode. The doctor has made it so that the ship will explode and the creatures don't want it to. And then he picks up Donna. Did you think that that was the doppelganger at first when he gets her? Um, I thought that he picked correctly. And then when she freaks out when he leaves, I was like, oh, shit. But I didn't think for a second he wouldn't go back and figure it out. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, like, are they going to kill her off or whatever? Um, th there's also a sequence when he's going to get her where he's, like, in the TARDIS, but he's, like, moving it with his foot. Yeah, to go, yeah, yeah. Go down the, right, I, right, right. Very Marty McFly. Yes, yes. I really liked that visual a lot. Um, yeah, I... I, I I like that sequence and it was like really scary. I was like, Oh my God, will they kill her? But then, you know, you, you said that the doctor was going to save her. Um, basically the episode ends with them landing back on earth and it's just like chaos in the streets, like an airplane crashes. There's people yeah. fighting in the streets of London. Um, and then it basically sets up our last episode, right. but uh, yeah, I'm going to stop our video for this one now and then we can go talk about the last one, The Giggle. So you guys, make sure you check out that next episode. Was there anything else you wanted to say about Wild Blue Yonder? Um, well, I, I, what do you think about, there's a joke in the beginning of it where the doctor says something about Isaac Newton being attractive. And then he kind of goes, oh, am I, am I, is that me now? And then Donna makes a joke like, well, uh, she says like, it was always close to the surface. Like me, oh. like she always thought he was gay. Right. And then, <laughs> 
fuck with this? <laughs> they're, the telly. they're making Dr. Gay on the telly. <laughs> oh, man. This guy used to be a stand-up comedian, everybody. He brings a call back at the very end of the episode to finish it off. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you and I discussed this last time that even though the doctor has been a woman, that even as a woman, yeah. she was still attracted to women, right? Right, right. So, so the doctor, at least up until this point, has been canonically having the sexual preference had nothing to do with gender, which is true to life. Um, right. But it is interesting. Although there were some jokes about Matt Smith being somewhat, because I remember someone saying something to Matt Smith and him saying something like, "Why are you, why are you human so like single minded?" I forget exactly what it was. So yeah. there's there's been bits in there about maybe him being gay. Yeah, yeah. He's I mean, a zillion year old alien that can't die. So yeah, why why know. wouldn't you be gay for a little while if you know you've lived so long, right? You gotta try right. everything. Um, yeah, yeah, man. So so that's a good point to end this particular episode on. Um, we will be back in next episode to talk about the giggle. Uh, Mike, do you want to do a quick plug for Pop Culture Man Children? Yes, Pop Culture Man Children is a podcast that's available anywhere podcasts are found. And coming up for Christmas, I am doing an episode on Eyes Wide Shut, my favorite Christmas movie. And I know it's yours as well. Yes. And um, and then stay tuned after that because uh, two weeks from when we're recording this, me and you, me and Peter, are doing an episode on Ghostbusters 2, my favorite New Year's Eve movie. Hell yeah. I'm excited about that. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, guys, make sure you check out Mike's show. If you guys are into sci-fi stuff, he's covered um, all the Star Trek movies up until Generations. Yeah. And I've really enjoyed those videos as well. Thanks. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week to talk about Doctor Who.